Hello everyone and welcome. This is Michael Conley, HP CareerNet, and today is the beginning of uh, what I think is going to be a really great new series. We've got Dr. Ron Getzel who's going to lay the groundwork or the C. Everett Coop Awards, and then we're going to have in the subsequent months, we're going to hear from some of the winners. So let me say to you that Ron Z. Getzel wears two hats, at least I would have to say. Uh, he is the director of the Emory University Institute for Health and Productivity Studies, IHPS, and vice president of consulting and applied research for Thomson Reuters. Uh, the mission of the IHPS is to bridge the gap between academia, the business community, and the healthcare policy world, uh, bringing academic research uh, into policy debates and the day-to-day -day business decisions, and bringing health and productivity management issues into academia. Dr. Getzel is a nationally recognized and widely published expert on health and productivity management, HPM, return on investment, ROI, those those great keywords or <laughs> acronyms, I guess, and uh, program evaluation and outcomes research. Uh, Dr. Getzel is a task force member of the Guide for Guide to Community Prevention Services housed at the CDC and president and CEO of the Health Project, which annually awards organizations the prestigious C. Everett Coop Prize for demonstrable health improvements and cost savings from health promotion and disease prevention programs. That's a lot, and that's well, that's only the tip of the iceberg, I think, Ron, because you are just a, uh, you're everywhere. <laughs> are you ready to get started? I am. Thank you so much, Michael. I appreciate it very much and appreciate uh, the interest of the audience in hearing about uh, the Health Project and the C. Everett Coop Award. You know, we're kind of at an important place in history, I think, right now with the passage of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, there's been a greater emphasis placed on prevention and health promotion. Uh, it's, an, I think, an unprecedented opportunity to influence how health care is being delivered in this country. Uh, where we spend uh, about $2.6, $2.7 trillion a year on health care services, but mostly it's for treatment of illnesses and disease, a small fraction of that, perhaps 3 to 5 percent, is spent on prevention and health promotion. But there are lots of new ideas that have been introduced into health care reform that uh, at least experiment with and test different approaches to health promotion disease prevention. What's, interested, what's interesting is that uh, throughout the last 30 years, really, uh, many organizations have experimented with and succeeded in providing health promotion disease prevention programs uh, in many cases, to their employees. Um, and these programs, believe it or not, have actually worked. Uh, the, the purpose of the C. Everett Coop Award is to highlight, recognize, and document programs that have been shown to be effective in improving health and simultaneously saving money. And so what I'd like to do today in our walk through this is to give you an introduction to the Health Project and the C. Everett Coop Award. Uh, to spend a little bit of time describing what it takes to apply for the award and some frequently asked questions about the award. Um, a lot of people want to find out, you know, what do I need to do, how do I do it, uh, what are the ins and outs, uh, and so forth. So I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time describing that. Um, I'll also give you uh, some samples of past winners, companies that have documented health improvement and cost savings, including uh, Pepsi Bottling Group, Citibank, Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble, uh, and King County. And then uh, we'll summarize our discussion, open it up for, uh, future, for, for, for questions, and, and talk about our future webinars. So what is the, the Health Project, the C. Everett Coop National Health Award? Uh, we are a nonprofit public-private partnership that recognizes organizations that have demonstrated health improvements and cost savings from their health promotion and disease prevention programs. Uh, we've been in operation since 1994. Uh, in the first year of our existence, we recognized the following organizations as having documentary evidence of health improvement and cost savings. They included Johnson & Johnson, Aetna, Dow Chemical, L.L. Bean, Quaker Oats, Steelcase, and Union Pacific Railroad. In fact, some of these uh, companies have come back and reapplied for the award with new data, with new information, with new interventions, 
And in some cases, they have won the award multiple times. In fact, I think Union Pacific Railroad is the leader in that regard in that they have won the Coop Award four times. Uh, the health project is dedicated to improving America's, Americans' health and reducing the need and demand for medical services through good health practices. Our board of directors includes our honorary chairman, Dr. Coop, who is at the Coop Institute at Dartmouth up in New Hampshire. Our chairman and co-founder is Carson Beadle. I'm the president and CEO. Our chief science officer is Dr. Jim Fries from Stanford University. And our secretary treasurer is Jim Wheel. The following page gives you a list of the board members, the current board members. And this is important because these are the people who are tasked with reviewing the applications for the award. Uh, they're the ones who independently evaluate these awards, and they participate in discussions about worthy winners. And you can see it really is a potpourri of individuals, uh, academics, uh, people in practice of delivering health promotion disease prevention programs and services. And we also have uh, various uh, individuals from companies who have, that have won the award in the past. Uh, we, uh, none of the people on the board, including myself and the officers of the board, are, are paid for our services. We are volunteers in this initiative, and we've been so for the life of the, the health project. Uh, we do ask for sponsorship and donation of the award uh, over time. That's basically to maintain the administrative infrastructure for the award. Uh, we do not hand out any kind of cash prize for winners of the award, it's just recognition uh, for having achieved the Coop Award. But in order to maintain uh, our structure and our administration, uh, we are very, very grateful to supporters and sponsors of the health project, which are listed here. We also have a, uh, a newly revamped website. We just uh, launched our new website with a new look and feel just in the last month. This is what it looks like. It's easy to find. All you have to do is go to thehealthproject.com, and there it is. And on the website, you'll see a lot of very useful information about the award process, but also gain insight into winners and uh, actually get a lot of information about their applications and what allowed them to win the award. Uh, here's a list of last year's winners. The 210 winners of the award were Medical Mutual of Ohio for their Wellness for Life program, Pfizer Healthy Pfizer program, the Volvo Group Health for Life program. And we also, each year, where it's appropriate, uh, identify organizations that achieve an honorable mention status. And essentially, they have fulfilled some of the requirements for getting the award, but not all the requirements. But we do want to recognize them as well. And in 2010, they included the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees Council 31, uh, Berkshire Health Systems, Lowe's Companies, and Trek Bicycle Corporation. The two prior year winners, or the, or the winners of the two prior years, rather, included in 2009 Alliance Data, LL Bean, Nationwide Mutual Insurance Company, and in 2008 the Dow Chemical Company, Energy Corporation of America, Lincoln Industries, and Vanderbilt University. Uh, people often ask me, uh, is there a minimum or a maximum number of winners? Uh, the answer is no. Um, actually, uh, we would like to hand out as many awards as, as possible in terms of worthy organizations. Uh, some years we've had one winner only, and in other years we've had as many as seven winners. Uh, typically, they're are about 20 to 25 applicants who submit uh, their, their documentation to win the award. And again, it varies by year, uh, depending upon the strength of the evidence documenting their success. Uh, just a few pictures of uh, award recipients. Uh, this is Stuart Sill from IBM, uh, who now uh, who was an award winner and now sits on the board. Winners from Vanderbilt University and winners from Dow Chemical Company. Uh, Dr. Koop uh, historically has given the award. Unfortunately, 
in uh, recent years, he uh, has been too ill to travel to the award ceremony. And so we have figured out other ways in which we can get him involved uh, through interviews and uh, recordings and, and other means. But he is still very, very much engaged and involved in the HELP project. This is what uh, the award application looks like. Uh, it uh, can be found on the helpproject.com website. Uh, it's a fairly simple application process. What's uh, critical there is the documentation that, uh, that accompanies the application itself. And this year, the submission deadline is Friday, May 27. Uh, we uh, review all of the applications during the month of June, and then we hold a special board meeting in July to discuss the uh, ratings that uh, the board members have assigned to the various applications. Our decisions about the winners are typically uh, made at the end of July, and the award ceremony is in September this year. It's in September again as part of the annual Hero Forum. All right, so what do you have to do in order to receive the COOP Award? There are three main considerations. The first is that the program must meet the health project's goal of reducing the need and demand for medical services. Secondly, to share the objectives of healthy people, health promotion targets, and then finally prove net health care and or productivity cost reductions while at the same time improving population health. So those, broadly speaking, are the objectives of the award. But let me go through a little bit more detail in terms of how one goes about winning the award. And the way that I've structured this is through uh, frequently asked questions. And if you'll bear with me, I'll actually uh, read the question and give you a response. Uh, and then later on, you, you may uh, ask for further clarification if needed. First question, are there any minimum requirements for application? So the answer is there are no specific requirements that are set regarding participation rates in programs, risk reduction, cost outcomes, because each organization has its unique challenges. However, it would benefit the applicant to demonstrate high participation in a program, that the program is comprehensive in nature and not single focus. There is net risk reduction. In other words, more people improve health and worsen their health over time, and that cost savings exceed program expense, so that you're actually hopefully coming up with a positive return on investment. Uh, longer term programs, those are, that are in place for three or more years, are generally higher rated than those are in their first formative and beginning years. What are programs evaluated on? Well, they're evaluated on adherence to evidence-based practices, comprehensiveness, participation rates, health improvement, risk reduction, and net cost savings. Are requirements different for small and large organizations? Another common question that, that's asked, you know, most of the winners have been large organizations, but uh, what about small companies, small organizations, can they apply? Well, the answer is that smaller organizations are, are not expected to do the kind of sophisticated claims analyses that are typically found with large businesses. But if they can document cost stabilization over, let's say, a three to five year period, if their healthcare costs have not gone up dramatically over that period without any significant benefit plan design changes or other utilization management measures, that's often considered sufficient in terms of demonstrating cost savings. We do, of course, also look for documentation for health improvement. Does a published article serve as a gold standard? Yes, that's always nice to see if a third party, an objective organization, uh, has reviewed the program, evaluated the program, and better yet, published its findings in a peer-reviewed journal. Uh, it's relevant, of course, if it's informative of the evaluation results, demonstrating health improvement and cost savings, but it's not a requirement. Is financial impact required, or is change in risk status and utilization sufficient? The answer is that health behavior change and risk reduction plus cost savings are required. So you can't have one but not the other. And, and doesn't, it works the other way, too. You can't just document cost savings or uh, even return on investment without also demonstrating health improvement and risk reduction. If the organization claims a positive return on investment, a positive ROI, then both savings and program costs need to be documented. Reduced utilization, which is translated into financial impact, may be considered. 
as long as that reduced utilization is not achieved through benefit plan design, rationing, outsourcing, utilization review, and other common measures for cost management. There needs to be this link back to health improvement and risk reduction. Our vendor reports as good as independent third-party analyses. Uh, it's certainly true that independent analyses wield greater influence, but vendor reports are acceptable if they have well-documented methodology and are credible. What kind of supporting materials do you need? Well, we want to see ENDS. ENDS is a, a shorthand way of saying we, we want to know the numbers of people who are involved in these programs and the data related to those numbers. We want to see tables, graphs, clear annotation, footnotes, and statistics. Those are always good things to have. How are winners determined? The way we go about determining winners is that uh, the applications are independently reviewed and scored by board members. They do this on their own independently. They review these applications on a 100 to 500 point scale, similar to what the NIH has used in the past in evaluating applications for NIH funding, where a score of 100 represents a superior program. Uh, reviewers score the applications using, using their best judgment, and there are also specific criteria that have been established. Greater emphasis is placed on program evaluation and results. So we want to look at both the program design and its implementation, but uh, the main focus really is uh, has the program achieved the health risk reduction and cost outcomes. Scores of 300 and above typically indicate that the, review, that the application is non-competitive for the COOP award. So we certainly typically start with scores of, 300, of under 300. Uh, we take all the scores, we average them, we look at them with and without outliers. And then those scores that uh, are, those applications that are below 300, they're considered to be COOP award eligible, but it's not automatic. We then have uh, a lot of discussion about these applications. And sometimes uh, organizations are deemed to be eligible for honorable mention, but not the award itself. The final determination, though, is made through a discussion, a back and forth discussion, oftentimes a heated discussion among board members, uh, who then finalize the determination of the COOP winners. So how do you go about doing this? How do you go about convincing people that the organization has actually achieved uh, the noteworthy status of being a COOP winner? So you've got to convince us, convince the board members, that the organization improved health and saved money. And you know, if you step back from this, you know, the logic flow that we, we typically look at, we know that a large proportion of diseases and disorders from which people suffer is preventable, that modifiable health risk factors are precursors to many diseases and disorders and premature death, and that many modifiable risk factors are associated with increased healthcare costs, even within a relatively short time window, not to mention diminished productivity. The key, where we start really looking at the evidence is at item number four and five and six. So we want to see evidence that the program has been able to improve the risk profile to modify the health risks through effective comprehensive evidence-based health promotion disease prevention programs. That improvements in the risk profile of the population has led to reductions in healthcare costs or improvements in productivity. And by the way, we will consider reductions in absenteeism, improvements in productivity, workers' comp, disability, all those other metrics as relevant to the to a documentation of cost savings. And then, you know, if you do it right, uh, there is growing evidence that these well-designed, well-implemented programs can be cost beneficial, meaning that they can actually save more money than they cost in the first place, and that's what produces a positive ROI. Uh, there is ample evidence out there that these things are true, and we've listed here some of the uh, studies uh, that have documented each of these bullet points. And in fact, many of the programs that have documented a positive ROI are also those that have won the COOP award in the past. So if you think about it, you know, the first step really is documenting that poor health costs money uh, across multiple dimensions, not just direct medical costs, but also absence and work loss, safety, presenteeism, which is on-the-job productivity loss, and the risk factors that support those losses. Uh, we've done a series of what we call top 10 studies where we look at the most expensive health conditions that employers face. Uh, 
In this case, we looked at both medical costs, absence, and disability costs on a per capita basis, looking at the relative rank ordering, ordering of certain con, con, common conditions that employers have, and they, of course, include angina, hypertension, diabetes, low back disorders, a heart attack, COPD, all of which have a significant lifestyle component associated with them. And then there, the other important piece, which we're now beginning to collect a lot of documentary evidence on, is on-the-job productivity loss. This analysis looks at certain common chronic health conditions. Uh, and you can see that a large proportion of the cost of those conditions uh, can be attributable back to people coming to work with these conditions, but those conditions not being well managed. And therefore, there's a loss of productivity, loss of on-the-job performance, which can be monetized, can be assigned a dollar value. And then, of course, there are risk factors that predict these expenditures. This is uh, a slide from the HERO study conducted over 10 years ago that looks at 10 modifiable health risk factors and their independent contribution to increase health care costs in the short term. Uh, this study, by the way, we are now in the final stages of finalizing an update of these uh, data, uh, actually uh, looking at much more recent data and looking at these modifiable risk factors and seeing whether these kinds of relationships hold up over time. We've also conducted a series of other studies, this one with PepsiCo, for example, where we've looked not just at medical costs, but we've also brought in other variables into the analysis, including uh, disability, workers' comp, presenteeism. Uh, here, in the case of uh, Pepsi, uh, we look at medical costs, short-term disability, workers' comp, presenteeism, absenteeism, for uh, five different categories of weight. Employees at normal weight, those who are overweight, and then in terms of obesity, comparing class 1, 2, and class 3 obesity. In this population, three-quarters of the population being either overweight or obese, and showing the incremental costs associated for these relative uh, rankings of overweight and obesity for each of these outcome categories. So it's fairly uh, obvious uh, to see the, the costs that are associated with this one risk factor, and we, we do that for other risk factors as well. Uh, this study, which is similar to the one shown for PepsiCo, but this is across multiple work sites across the United States as part of an NIH study, uh, translates the dollars into utilization metrics that are common to the medical community, such as doctor visits, ER visits, hospital admissions, and then absenteeism and presenteeism, and in each case showing that obese individuals are much more costly in each of these categories compared to normal weight individuals. Then, of course, the question is, uh, are you able to influence that? Are you able to reduce the risk profile of the population through effective health promotion disease prevention programs. A uh, literature review that we conducted over 10 years ago for the CDC indicated that the answer was yes. Uh, we reviewed 47 studies back there looking at comprehensive multi-component worksite health promotion programs going back over a 20-year period and certainly found a great deal of diversity in terms of the design and implementation of these programs, but found that there were also some common elements that showed that these programs could have long-standing behavior change in employer populations, employee, employee and employer populations. What seemed to make a difference is providing opportunities for individualized risk reduction counseling, but it would have to be within the context of a comprehensive program what is now being referred to as a culture of health. And more recently, the CDC Community Guide to Preventive Services has also concluded its review of the literature looking at worksite health promotion programs that start off with assessment of health risk and feedback and then have follow-up interventions after that assessment. The results of this study were published this year in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine. And this is just a summary of some of the findings from that review. Uh, the reviewers looked at a variety of outcomes, including behavioral risk factors, biometric risk factors, and then other metrics important to employers they found, looking at the evidence, that there was sufficient or strong evidence to show that worksite health promotion programs could have a positive influence on alcohol use, percent fat intake in the diet, physical activity, tobacco use, C 
seatbelt non-use. On biometric measures, strong evidence that these programs could have a significant effect on blood pressure and cholesterol. And then strong or sufficient evidence that these programs could influence overall population health risk, healthcare use, and worker productivity. So this is a fairly uh, intensive and systematic review of literature that's out there showing that these programs actually can have a very positive significant effect on not just health outcomes, but also financial and productivity outcomes that are important to employers. Well, what about return on investment? Is there any documentary evidence there that uh, these programs can actually save more money than they cost? And the answer is yes, there's a growing body of evidence there. Uh, the importance of this DARE case is to show that in order to achieve a financial ROI, you need to follow all of these steps. You need to climb all these steps, as a matter of fact. Uh, you need to increase awareness about health and health issues, have high participation rates in the program, increase knowledge, and the, the awareness that's needed to change people's behavior, improve attitudes, especially motivation to change, change behavior, reduce risk, reduce utilization, and if you do all those things and they're complementary to one another, then there's a good likelihood that you will achieve a positive financial ROI. There was another lit review that was published this year. This was in Health Affairs by three economists from Harvard University. Um, the article is shown here. Baker, Cutler, and Song were the authors of this. And the headline here is that workplace wellness programs can generate savings. Uh, the authors, and these are people not uh, traditionally involved in worksite health promotion programs or evaluation evaluations of those programs, they, they went back and looked at the literature and tried to parse it out and look at it from a variety of ways and, and see if they can come up with any, any general conclusion. So they looked at medical care cost savings separately from absenteeism cost savings and looking at the medical studies that are out there, a uh, variety of different ways, the overall uh, consensus was that these programs appear to be achieving a return on investment of roughly three to one, three dollars saved for every dollar invested. And a very similar type of result was found in terms of absenteeism results. Again, somewhere around a three to one ROI in absenteeism. Now, it could be argued that you could add absenteeism and medical costs and potentially achieve even a larger effect. Let me just very briefly review uh, some case studies of past winners of the Coop Award. Uh, one was Citibank. Uh, this was uh, a program that was put into place at Citibank in the 1990s. Uh, there are about 48,000 eligible employees for the program. Uh, this was a comprehensive multi-component program that focused not just on health promotion, but also demand management and chronic disease management. The idea of the program was to uh, influence uh, the demand for uh, healthcare services through health improvement and risk reduction. And Citibank was also interested in whether the program produced a positive return on investment. The program was structured in the way that everybody was eligible to complete a health risk appraisal. And based upon their response to the health risk appraisal, they were then triaged into either high risk or low risk category. And these are, of course, relative terms. It's lower risk and higher risk. And the higher risk people receive quite a bit of attention in terms of uh, ongoing health risk appraisals at three-month intervals, letters, reports, uh, feedback, books, audio tapes, video tapes, and counseling and coaching for their risk factors. As I said, there were about 48,000 eligible US-based employees, and over half participated in the program with only a $10 incentive for participation. That was a very relatively small incentive at the time, which at that time achieved a pretty high level of participation, and 3,000 people were enrolled in the high-risk program. Now, how do we go about evaluating whether the program improved health or not? Uh, this is an example of how to go about documenting that. What we're looking at here is a cohort of employees. There are 9,234 employees who are followed over a two-year period. And essentially what we're looking at here is let's take the first category of fiber, and what that is a risk factor for is not getting enough fruits and vegetables in your diet. And so at the beginning of the program, 95% of the employees did not get enough fruits and vegetables in their diet. 
At the end of the program, 93% did not. So actually, uh, from a meaningful standpoint, not a whole lot of improvement, although it turned out to be statistically significant, with a 2% net, net savings, net percent improvement in that risk factor. And as you can see in other risk factors, similar types of improvements, but not very significant. There are 2 to 3 4% net improvements in the risk profile, although in uh, 8 out of the 11 categories, those improvements were positive and statistically significant. Now, when you look at the population that improved its risk profile, uh, those people who were able to improve one, two, or three risk factors on a net basis, uh, there was actually a significant reduction in cost for those people, especially for those who improved on three risk categories. Citibank saved somewhere around $146 to $147 per employee per month for that group of people who showed a net reduction in three risk factors. And looking at the experience of about 23,000 employees who were involved in the study, uh, followed over a 38-month time period, uh, looking at their pre-program costs and their post-program costs, these costs are per employee per month. Uh, the net difference in cost between participants and non-participants turned out to be $35 per employee per month. And if you take that amount and you multiply it by the roughly 11,000 participants and the roughly 23 months of exposure to the program, you do the math, and that ends up being about $8.9 million in savings, which for Citibank was a positive net savings. Program cost $1.9 million. Benefits were $8.9, so a net savings of $7 million, and an ROI, in this case, of $4.70 for every dollar invested. So that's an example of a fairly rigorous evaluation of both health outcomes and cost savings that earned Citibank the Coop Award. Another example is Johnson & Johnson. They've done a whole series of different studies over the years, uh, including those studies that were conducted in the 1980s. Uh, there were studies that were conducted in the 1990s that looked at uh, their experience over a nine-year period, from 1990 through 1999. And uh, there are studies underway right now that will document the results actually in the 21st century for the period of around 2002 to 2008. The 1990 study, uh, this was a cohort of employees, about 4,500 employees who were followed for two and three quarter years. Uh, these, this was different selections than Citibank. These are actually people who were invited into high-risk intervention programs because they were high-risk to begin with. So it's a little bit of a different sample than the Citibank population, which was across everyone, whether you were high-risk or not. But you can see here that there actually are much more significant reductions in the risk profile of the population uh, between time one and time two, time two being two and three quarters years after the baseline in certain key areas. There are other areas that they did not show improvement. Uh, including body weight, which is one of the, the toughest areas to influence. But in many of these risk categories, there were statistically significant improvements over time. And if you looked at their data from 1990 through 1999, uh, there was a trend in lower utilization of healthcare services, uh, mostly in terms of inpatient days. And the combination of that lower trend produced an average savings of roughly $225 per employee per year. And in fact, for the four years that we looked at post-implementation of this new benefit plan design program that emphasized health promotion disease prevention, much more so than before, uh, the, the savings actually grew over time. I mentioned earlier that uh, right now there's uh, an analysis of data that looks at the healthcare costs for Johnson & Johnson, Johnson, including uh, the risk profile trends for the corporation over time. Uh, what, we're looking, what we're seeing here is 2002 to 2008 increases in healthcare costs for Johnson & Johnson when compared to a normative group that's been very carefully matched to the Johnson & Johnson population. And we're seeing a much lower rate of increase in annual healthcare costs compared to the normative group. So the kinds of results that were uh, seen back in the 1980s and 1990s seem to be affected and linger on and actually are sustained uh, even 30 years after the program was introduced. 
Other case studies include Procter & Gamble, and this is Cincinnati, Ohio headquarters, about 8,000 people, where over three years there was a statistically significant difference between participants in the program compared to non-participants. Uh, the, the effect of that influence, the difference rather, was about a 29% difference in total medical expenditures. I want to uh, note King County. King County uh, did not win the award. They were an honorable mention. But I think they're important to take note of uh, simply because this is very different than some of the other case studies that uh, I presented, which are largely focused on uh, corporate programs. This is a county program. This is a public uh, sector program. King County is uh, the Seattle, Washington area. Uh, they've got a very unique situation, 13,000 employees, 30,000 plan members, but they have very strong labor unions. In fact, there are 92 separate bargaining units that King County has. Uh, with uh, admittedly very rich benefit plan design, a dwindling tax base, rising public expectations, very comprehensive program, and if they did nothing at all, their health care costs would double uh, over a, a time period, uh, 2012, for over a 10-year period. And this was uh, too high a level for the county and, and quite honestly, for uh, the labor unions as well. They wanted to be part of an intervention program that would reduce health care spending, but at the same time improve health. So there was a partnership there between labor and management and the county uh, to introduce a comprehensive health promotion program uh, where people were rewarded for participating in the program. Uh, we did several analyses on this program. Here we're looking at 14 risk factors. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a population of employees and their spouses and partners. Uh, we had roughly an, close to 90% participation among employees in the program, and we're seeing a statistically significant reduction in uh, 12 out of the 14 risk factors over this three-year time horizon. And when you hear the term bending the curve, you know, what does that really mean? Well, here is an, an illustration of what that means. Essentially, it's looking at the rates of health care costs and the increases in all those health care costs and seeing if you can somehow influence it bend that curve downward so that the rate of increase is lower than it would, would have been had uh, no interventions been put in place. And in this case, uh, the healthcare trend for King County was roughly 11% before the program began. As a result of the program, uh, it's right now at about 8 or 9%, which is still very, very, very high. However, just that minor change in the rate of increase uh, has saved King County tens of millions of dollars in terms of health care costs. So to summarize, uh, the Health Project aims to recognize organizations that have documented health improvements and cost savings. Uh, size of the organization is not important. The results are. And uh, there is this growing body of scientific literature, and I've alluded to it in terms of not just the case studies that I reviewed, but also the various literature reviews that are out there including those conducted by very respected economists at Harvard, as well as the CDC Community Guide. But there's growing body of evidence showing that these programs can improve the health of workers, lower their risk for disease, save businesses money by reducing health-related losses and limiting absence and disability, heighten worker morale and work relations, improve worker productivity, and finally, uh, improve the financial performance of the organizations that institute these programs and have a bottom line effect. And I'm hopeful that uh, the Coop Award, as well as all of the efforts among the organizations that have won the award, as well as those that are vying to win the award, that those efforts are recognized uh, by us and by others. And so a final note from Dr. Coop, I hope that you'll consider joining us during this exciting time as together we look to the future of the health project, health improvement, and cost containment. And with that, I will stop and open it up for any questions or comments that you may have. Michaela? All right. Well, that was, uh, that was great. Um, it's, it's awesome to see a, an overview and see how many companies are really working hard to um, provide that evidence that, um, you know, it's working. <laughs> Uh, let me say that if you have questions, you can either type them into the box, or if you'd like to, I can unmute your microphone, uh, and you can ask 
Ron directly. Um, I think maybe you mentioned it, Ron. Uh, I have a question while people type away. Um, how many how many companies typically apply each year? Uh, historically, we've had anywhere from fifteen to about twenty five companies apply somewhere mm. in that neighborhood. And does it does it um, what's the the application process is basically submit your stuff and then it goes to the board members and such. Is there any back and forth on that? Not really, no, no. We, no. we don't uh, provide counseling or coaching. We do provide feedback, though. You know, after companies have submitted their applications um, and they're deemed reviewable, then uh, the board members independently uh, list the, uh, the, the positives and negatives on each application, and they will, that information will be shared back uh, with the applicant company, and, and very often they use that information uh, and then improve their methods and resubmit the following year. Hmm. Great, yeah, that would be an uh, incredible benefit to be able to get that kind of feedback in detail from such a well-known and experienced audience. Um, okay, people are, I know that, I don't know what it is, but everybody, it happens every single week, nobody wants to be the first one. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, they're sitting in the back of the room, or somebody, some of you are sitting in the back of the room going, not me, not me, not me. <laughs> um, let's see, what else? I don't have you, want, you want to talk a little bit about future webinars that uh, will be upcoming? That's a really good idea. Which winners may be uh, presenting at? Yep, that's good, that's good. Yeah, um, this, is, this is the beginning of uh, what I think is really going to be an awesome series, an opportunity to really see what people have done to to achieve the award, but also you know hear their unique stories and and such. So um, you can mark your calendar that the second Wednesday of each month, um, beginning February 9th, it'll be February 9th, March 9th, April 13th, May 12th. I'm sorry, May 11th. June 8 and July 13, we'll be hearing from each of the um, award winners from both 2010 and 2009. So uh, that'll be uh, Medical Mutual Ohio, Wellness for Life, Pfizer, uh, Healthy Pfizer Program, the Volvo Group, Health for Life, Alliance Data, Healthy Alliance, L.L. Bean, uh, Healthy Bean, and uh, Nationwide Mutual Insurance Company, My Life, My Choice, and My Health. You know, I had last year at um, the HERO conference, uh, or maybe it was the year before, I had the opportunity to sit with the, uh, the L.L. Bean people um, for uh, lunch. I guess it was the awards lunch. And what a fun bunch of people they were. <laughs> I, uh, I had chosen to sit with them just because, you know, I love L.L. Bean. Uh, but it was great to be able to hear the details and, and all that they have done and, you know, just sort of celebrate with them. Uh, and then pa this past year I sat with Trek Bicycle, also a uh, huge, fav or huge, huge um, favorite of mine. Um, let's see, here we, have a, we do have a question from Linda. Thank you, Linda, for being the first. Uh, has, have any states won the award? Uh, not yet, no. Not yet. Nope. Well, Linda, there you go. There you go. <laughs> the pressure's on. Sorry. Uh, yeah, it would be great, especially with um, one of the other series. I think I may have mentioned to you, Ron, that we've been doing is the state of wellness, um, and it's a public. Or I mean, the efforts at the state level to support worksite health promotion and wellness programs. So. You know, I think it would be it would be a great step forward to see one of the states uh, win a Coop Award. Yeah, in fact, I'm aware of several states that have put in place programs. Uh, Delaware, I think Idaho, uh, Washington, a few others that have uh, fairly comprehensive worksite programs. So, you know, I encourage them to apply. Mm. Yeah, I think that would be pretty incredible. Well, anyone else? Any other questions? Um, thoughts? You know, Ron, I would, um, I think I told you that um, we had Bill Bond last week uh, who 
brought, who you ended up being the uh, topic of discussion several times for all your great work on ROI and such. And I, uh, I mentioned to uh, Bill that you were going to be uh, actually following him this week. And uh, he encouraged me to see if I can't twist your arm and get you to come and just talk about ROI or health and productivity, you know, whatever, whatever is you're feeling most passionate about at this moment. So, um, so we'll talk, uh, but I would love to have you back again because, um, you know, you're a wealth of information. That'd be, that'd be fine. Great. Super. In fact, we, we uh, held a series of webinars for the CDC under a LeanWorks program where one of the topics was the ROI. So happy oh, to super. That. Super. Okay, Leslie says, I'm working on a collaboration with employees uh, very size, vary in size from 850 to 2400. Uh, they are non-profit hospital, city, state, district. Uh, any suggestions on how to evaluate ROI for these smaller non-profit employers? Well, you know, as I said, for, for smaller employers, I don't know, if you can document that their health care costs have been relatively stable over time um, and that the program is uh, a reasonable cost and, and it's important to, to note what the cost, the cost of the program, the expense side of the equation is, but if you're able to show kind of stable health care costs over time without radical benefit plan design, utilization management, you know, uh, all kinds of other methods of reducing costs, uh, that often is good enough uh, because the reviewers do take into consideration the size of the organization, and for a small organization, they're not able to do very fancy claims analyses. Mm. Yeah, that makes me think. Uh, I've heard some people talking about, you know, uh, obesity and such, and saying that really that maybe the goal should be just to not gain weight. That staying, remaining, you know, at a static level is really a plus. So mm -hmm. kind of the same along the same lines, I think. Uh, let's see. Um, I'll, gi I'll give them another one minute to ask uh, those burning questions, and we'll see uh, see what we get from them. Um, let's see. Well, let's see, Ron. Where where are we going to see each other next? I think you said you're going to be at Michael O'Donnell's American Journal of Health Promotion Conference. Yes. Uh, anything else coming up for you? Well, lots of things coming up, but I think <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, poorly worded right? question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, certainly, I'm, I'm I'm there, and that's always a good place to gather for health promotion uh, promotion professionals. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, well, I think. All right, I, I think I think we uh, we probably conferred as much information as people can handle it. Point. Yep, I think you're right. So, uh, hope uh, hopefully they'll, you guys will join us for the continuing series, and we will uh, we'll learn some really great stuff together. And Ron, I will pin you down soon and get you to come and talk about ROI because I know that it's a it's a really hot topic. All right, I look forward to that, and thank you, Michael, for arranging this. Appreciate it very much. Oh, you're very welcome. Well, everyone, have a great day. Hope I'll see you soon, and maybe even on Friday. We've got um, Nedra Wine. Oh, I forget her last name. Nedra, um, talking about social marketing, and we've got uh, over 500 people registered right now. So it's a it's a happening thing. So everyone, take care. Ron, have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you guys soon. Thank you. Bye bye.